Hello everyone, you are very welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is how to gain advantage in masonry design using year line analysis over traditional Eurocode methods. My name is Andras Hervey, I'm the sales manager here at the Master Series and joining me in this webinar as last time is Patrick McKinley. Before we start uh, the presentation, I would like to quick, I would like to quickly share uh, some practical information about the GoToWebinar. The control panel uh, can be hidden with the red arrow button. Questions or messages can be set, uh, sent with the with the chat option. Feel free to type in your question, some questions at any time during the webinar. My colleagues will answer them during the session, but I will do a review the questions at the end of the webinar as well. As usual, this webinar uh, is being recorded and will be posted to our channels and sent out to your email addresses. Quickly about the, the agenda. At first, uh, Patrick will shortly review the traditional analysis methods in Masonry design. After that, he will talk about uh, the e line analysis in detail. And then he will look through the benefits of using e line analysis over the traditional methods. Then Patrick will talk about quickly wind post, peers, and uh, reinforcement. And after that, I will demonstrate how to design Masonry walls quickly and accurately using the advanced e line analysis. And of course, we will finish uh, with a QA section. Okay, uh, let me hand over the presentation to Patrick. talk about uh, the background of Masonry design. So Patrick. Um, yes, as Andres has uh, introduced there, today I'll be talking about the design of laterally loaded uh, masonry cavity walls, specifically in the UK. Um, please do get involved in the comment sections. It would be great to hear feedback and about your different design experiences on a, a fairly common topic uh, with an engineer. Some of what I will cover today may be new to some of you, but uh, also might serve as a refresher to others. Again, as for the last webinar, we're focusing on our role as a structural designer. Um, so in, in my research, I started off with lots of different references, but most of the good information that I found was already replicated in the I struck the manual for the uh, design of plain masonry and building structures to Eurocode 6. Uh, as the name suggests, the manual is based on Eurocode 6, but it also carries a lot of good guidance on some matters, included in uh, British Standards 5628, which are not dealt with in the Eurocode. And also, uh, I've used similar text from the Concrete Centre, um, quite a good little uh, three-part publication called How to Design Masonry Structures Using Eurocode 6. And also from the Concrete Design uh, Concrete Centre, the Practical Yield uh, Line Design. Um, also, the opposites for national statistics there, you, you'll see. Um, first, uh, I'm going to go over uh, some basics, including uh, the, the UK housing market. Um, so you'll see a list of, list of topics there, uh, about 10 slides, and then on to Andres for his uh, Master Series uh, demonstration. So, uh, as you can see there, See, I'm going to get into some numbers relating to the market and where masonry cavities walls fit into the construction market industry. Um, to get an idea of scale, approximately just under 2 billion bricks are consumed on average per year in the UK, uh, and that's over the past 10 years. 60% um, of those bricks are for new housing, and the other 40% are between commercial buildings and repair and maintenance. And to provide actual figures over the previous 10 years, 175,000 new homes are built on average per year. And of those new houses, 85% are masonry cavity. So that's 150,000 new houses per year using masonry cavity walls. Uh, I actually done the math on it, and that's about 8,000 bricks per house. And it checks out based on the average floor area of a house. Uh, so like any good, good engineer, you have to do a secondary check there. So um, 
And in most situations there, you're going to have lateral load governing the structural design of these cavity panels. So let's say uh, six external wall panels per house. Uh, so that's that's six times 175 there. So uh, you, you're chatting nearly a million uh, or, or just over a million individual wall panels subject to lateral load. Uh, bear in mind, a lot of these are repeat designs, but and all what percentage of those one million wall panels could probably be designed a bit better. Um, and as mentioned in the invitation email, in many cases, the design of these wall panels is based on a lot of times rule of thumb or just conservative design. So um, based on my based on these figures, and in my opinion, I think there's a good market there for having an age and efficient domestic wall panel design. Um, I don't know if that comes across as a sales pitch for our advanced mastery designer software, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a structural engineer. <laughs> so um, under, under actual cavity wall buildup, so our cavity wall is composed of two masonry walls separated by an airspace, which is good for thermal and sound insulation. The outer face is typical brick, and it faces outside of the building structure. Inner face may be constructed of masonry units such as concrete, block, structural clay, brick, or reinforced concrete. Uh, these two walls are they're fastened together, usually with uh, metal ties, which strengthen the cavity wall and share the lateral loads. Um, I, I think it's a good idea to have a... Uh, I think it's good to have an idea of the demand and use for the different types of brick and block. So I've included some charts taken from, from the Office of National T Statistics. Um, as you can see there, brick, the majority of clay bricks manufactured in the UK are of, of, of high density classification and will be the type normally used for structural masonry. Um, facing bricks, they're the most popular type of bricks used in the UK, uh, as you can probably see there. And they make up for about 80% against engineering brick and common brick which are not as common anymore um, from back in the 70s, it would have been more common. But uh, I suppose that, that rate of facing brick correlates with, uh, with the rate of get earlier for the new houses. Um, and for the purposes of the external walls and houses facing bricks, they, they've got the right balance of cost, appearance and properties for, for the role. Common brick would be cheaper, but less compressive strength and there's less consistency uh, in its appearance. An engineering brick is typically more expensive and it's selective for its properties. Uh, for example, it's high compressive strength. And as well, Class A engineering bricks can be used as an outer face, rigid damp proof course due to their low absorption rate. Uh, and to give consideration to reclaim bricks uh, as a sustainable option, they'll need properly tested uh, to satisfy requirements. I think only about 5% of bricks uh, are reclaimed for reuse. I think one of the big issues is, is the cleaning of the, the new mortars off the bricks, uh, whereas lime mortar, uh, which we used, used to be used and is less common these days, was actually easier to clean and therefore reuse. Um, concrete blocks, they're split between three different types, dense, lightweight, and aerated. Uh, dense, they're the standard. They're ideal uh, and a cost effects is a solution for all types of low bearing walls. Uh, it's worth noting that they're about 20 kilogram uh, lifting capacity for health and safety limitations for workers and I think we're okay with the 100 th thick block but I think once you start getting uh, wider you, you, you have issues there so worth worth noting that the lightweight blocks their their main advantage over dense blocks would be their better insulating properties and their lighter weight which is good because others can safely handle the bigger blocks on site and at saves weight on foundation sizes and aerated it's uh, at least strong but it's suitable for low-rise construction and partitions but Otherwise, can perform a similar range of functions as, as dense and lightweight blocks do. Uh, some types of aerated block may not be suitable for use in walls uh, that might be close to chimneys or when too close to water and sulfates. So best to get uh, manufacturer's guidance on the use of aerated blocks if, the, if they're being specified. Uh, we've, all, we've got mortar there, the glue, keeping it all together. So you, you don't want that mortar being stronger than the bricks uh, as you want it to the more flexible of the two which will allow the bricks to move within the, the wall if it is moving. So uh, if the mortar is too hard, the bricks might end up cracking first. Um, the mortar comes in different mixes with different properties. So you want to be sensible and keep mortar mixes to a minimum on a project as well. You don't want uh, different mortar mixes on, on different adjoining panels either, for example. So in the case of differential panel movements, never mind any confusion that might arise on site from, from the different mixes. Um, finally, uh, wall ties. These are strips or bars made of metal that span the cavity and tie the internal and external walls of brick together. 
uh, the, the ends of the tie are designed to lock tightly under the mortar and they're designed to transfer water from the outer to the inner leaf of the wall. Um, this off, it often takes the form of a, of a twist or tie. Uh, uh, corrugation is formed in the wire. So they're, they're used at two and a half meter centers and I've got a, a wee image there that, that gives guidance on, on the spacing, uh, minimum and maximum as well. And I had some fancy animations built in there. Some design terms you'll need to be familiar with for the design of walls. Uh, I've, I've included a, a flowchart reference that shows a typical design procedure to Eurocode traditional flexural strength method. So some common design terms for the bricks and blocks. Uh, groups, they refer to the void percentage. Um, in UK, the codes only, UK codes only, groups one and two have values provided as three and four traditionally have not been used in the UK. Uh, masonry units, they're, they're manufactured in an, one of two units of categories called one and two appropriately, uh, depending on the level of quality controlled exercise during their manufacture, which contributes to the design by means of partial factors. It introduces alongside execution control class specification, and that's related to quality and insurance controls which takes into account the following factors. I'll, I'll read them off here. The, the level and quality of supervision provided by the contractor, the level and quality of inspectors independent of the contractor, and in design and build contracts, a designer may be considered as independent inspector where appropriate. Uh, the, the assessment of the site properties of the mortar and concrete infill, and the methods of batching and mixing of the constituents of the mortar. And of course there, we've got our compressive strength, the strength of, uh, of, the, of the blocks, and the flexural strengths uh, parallel and perpendicular to, to the, the, the laying of the bricks. And where you see the specification of mortar, M, the number after that uh, the, refers to the compressive class in Newton per meter squares of the, of the mortar after 28 days. And the low combinations for, for laterally loaded walls, we will typically, typically take one times dead, uh, which is a favorable load as, um, Typically, we want to treat vertical loads as favorable as they contribute to the flexural strength of the panel and our lateral loads as unfavorable. So uh, we've got our, our leading uh, live or imposed load as our, as our wind. So taking that conservatively for, for lateral load panels. Um, fixity conditions. Uh, there's another aspect of the design where we should probably spend a bit of time on. Um, here you need to understand the build and, and, and some detailing. Uh, there are a lot of engineering judgment is, is required here. So uh, the edge conditions are a requirement for the design approach, whether it's traditional or using yield line analysis. So you'll need to determine the difference between free, simply supported, partially fixed and fully fixed. Uh, there's, there's some good guidance on different scenarios in the manual. Uh, they're taken from British standards, but there's a lot of combinations we come up against, so engineering judgment is, is required, uh, as I say. Um, I'll, I'll maybe say it a, big, a good time to get any input or uh, from those listening to share knowledge or, or, or even ask questions about edge conditions or support conditions because we, we, we're going by uh, these, these eight, um, let me see. We're going by these sort of eight standards uh, or eight examples um, as a template, and then and working working from that. But uh, if you've any uh, input, please please do say in the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll run through some of the more common conditions. So vertical fixity conditions vary based on the type of return, whether it's a full wall or a pier, whether it's using uh, whether it's fully bonded or using ties, or whether it's on the edge of a wall or at the middle and. Likewise, conditions vary by, based on the above floor it's connected to using anchors, whether the above floor is cast onto the wall or not, and how the uh, wall is bearing onto a support for our, for our uh, horizontal. Actually, so we also need to pay attention to the position of movement joints and the effect it has on the panel in regards to size and restraint conditions. Damp proof courses, as, as noted there, introduce a little complication as a create a discontinu discontinu discontinuity in the laying of the bricks. And from the British standards, uh, quote, it should be noted that the flexural strength of damp proof courses should not be relied on unless suitable evidence based on test data is available. 
where flexural or sear strength is important, consideration may be given to the use of clay masonry unit damp proof course. So, and uh, DPC could be considered actually one of one of four things could be could be uh, all conditions. So it's it can be considered partially fixed as long as consideration has been given to gravity loads. Uh, I, I recall seeing tables uh, to allow for partial fixity uh, from the Concrete Masonry Designers Handbook, uh, as we see here. But uh, typically, simply uh, simply supported is assumed, and if the damper, of course, has good enough shear resistance. Uh, but if not, we assume it is a free age, uh, which, which would seem a bit strange, unless the membrane was made of some very, very slippery like Teflon or something. Uh, in a cavity wall, continuity across a vertical support may be assumed even if uh, only one leaf is continuous over the support, provided that the cavity wall contains the recommended spacing of ties, and that it is the thicker leaf that is continuous. And that's, that's a, there's a quote directly there from uh, the Miura code. Uh, in the case of cavity walls, full continuity may be assumed. Uh, and let me see. The, uh, the load is to be transmitted from a wall to a support may be taken by ties to one leaf only, provided there is adequate connection between the two leaves, particularly at the vertical edges of the walls. And in all cases, partial con continuity may be assumed. Uh, finally, we have an example there, uh, a junction between where an internal wall meets the underside of an existing floor. Um, and I'll just uh, bring that up a bit. Um, so this is this is one where a bit of engineering judgment would be required. Uh, we've got if, if we're taking uh, free edges as minus one hundred percent, simply supported as zero percent, and continuous as one hundred percent, we actually work out with a partial fixity uh, on this wall panel on the lower panel at about twenty five percent. So that's there's, there's a wee bit of miles required, and yeah, again, uh, that's your engineering judgment coming into play. Um, so before we get on to the, the design, I'll introduce the options for reinforcing the wall to resist lateral loads. Um, wind posts, uh, they're usually the favoured option, and they're introduced to provide intermediate support to a wall panel and give it resistance from horizontal forces, and in our case, wind. Uh, they usually come in the form of a, an SHS or a channel, uh, or even manufacturer design profiles, something that can be discreetly introduced into the wall without encroaching beyond the internal face. And uh, it's key to avoid creating a cold bridge between the outer and inner leaf. Um, Design-wise, they're designed as a simply supported beam spanning floor to floor, and they'll not be subject to any vertical load. And so the connection will need to be detailed as such. Uh, they're, they're favored by engineers, architects, and clients alike because of how discreet they are, but they're not ideal to install though, um, as they do disrupt the masonry build and need a bit of a lead in time as well for, uh, as well as detailing. So uh, bed reinforcement, that strengthens the wall along the horizontal axis. Uh, yield line, uh, failure lines, designs adapts to show this. Uh, but again, uh, bed reinforcement takes a bit of time to install. and They are disrupted with the presence of openings. Um, columns or piers, as although they can be built fairly easily, they're usually fairly low down in the list for the architect and client, at least because they protrude internally into the room and take up valuable space. Uh, but we've got internal walls there, which are obviously utilized whenever they can be. Um, wall thicklings, they're also an option, but again, they need in the rooms, room space and add weight and material to the construction. Um, in summary, you want any of these ball reinforcement options to be secondary. And if they're required to be as economical and efficient design as possible. And now under the reason we need the reinforcement in a lot of cases uh, has to do with openings. So let's see. Um, so th there's a few different ways of approaching uh, openings. So we've got we've got small openings. Uh, Euroco gives no exact def definition as what is defined as small, but Again, we need to consider that a small opening could be could be five percent of the total panel area, but it could be a long thin opening beside a support, which could effectively convert a four sided panel into a, a three way panel. Um, we do have a uh, 
we do have guidance and openings which can be accommodated without further calculation. Uh, taken, this is taken from the ISTOC D manual. Um, and also, if the openings are just a little bit bigger and small and stiffened with a timber or metal frame, the opening can, can be ignored. Uh, but this, will, again, will require a bit of engineering judgment on, on your behalf. For medium sized openings, we've got the sub panel method, which is the traditional method that we refer to uh, throughout, and it's the most common design method used for panels with openings. Uh, we'll talk a wee bit further about that on the next slide. Uh, where we can divide the panels into sub panels, which then refer back to our tabulated uh, values in the code, which are derived from our yield line analysis, actually. So we have a Reduce fixity method as well. Uh, we have that as, as an option in, in master series. Uh, this is not code derived, but it's an alternative method of dealing with openings. Um, it has some conditions to stick within. So uh, this is also from the same, th 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 this method is also from the same book that goes into detail on the partial fixity of damper, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the, the concrete masonry designer's handbook. Um, some rules to the reduce fixity method. Uh, Again, this, this design methods rules stays within the bounds of the codes, but uh, the opening can't be more than 25% of the panel area. It can't be more than half the panel length in either direction. And uh, we reduce the fixity of the supports to an amount equal to the length of the opening divided by the length of, of the side. So uh, to avoid confusion, that's uh, an example. Uh, if we've got a one meter opening and a five meter long panel, we get a reduction of 20%, i.e. 80% fixity. Um, finally, we've substantial openings. Um, and the quote from the Eurocode, when irregular shapes of walls or, uh, or those with substantial openings are to be designed, an analysis, analysis using a recognized method of attaining bending moments in flat planes or flat plates, for example, finite element method or yield line analogy may be used, taking into account an isotropy of masonry where appropriate, um, which will nicely bring us on to uh, our next slide, which is E-line theory. Um, and as a traditional Eurocode sub-panel method is based off of E-line theory, uh, I'll start here and then go on to the traditional method in the next slide. Uh, e-line e theory is, is aimed at experienced engineers and can get fairly complex, but I'll help give a brief understanding. Uh, of the topic, and I'll refer to concrete slabs as probably easier to understand uh, and, and translate across. So a yield line, in summary, is a crack in the slab where yielding occurs under load and a plastic hinges form, which then creates instability within, within the slab. So a yield line theory, which is a plastic theory, we are working out where the yield lines will form, uh, the, the yield line patterns, and, uh, and the load an element would need to cause collapse. Then we're making sure that load we apply does not exceed that. Um, so I'm going to blow that up again and so you can see it a bit better. So in yield line analysis, the designer can actually choose how moments are distributed be between spans by making one span stiffer than another. Uh, this can be done in reinforced slabs to an extent by amending the reinforcement, but usually the shorter spans are those where the reinforcement is greater. And in comparison, finite element analysis works using elastic analysis, which in reinforced concrete is not necessarily how it behaves. But and generally, plastic E-line analysis results in a more economical design, but it is fairly reliant on accurate E-line patterns. Um, initially, E-line patterns, the uh, E-line plastic theory was used for concrete slabs, which are fairly ductile. Uh, ductile meaning they deflect considerably more, considerably, considerably more before filling. But for masonry walls, we have a low ductility, uh, meaning a very brittle material. Brittle material. So I've included a, a, a stress strain diagram there for uh, reminding you all of the of the of the difference. Um, you can see with brittle materials, we strain the, the material more earlier with uh, with a similar stress. The concrete center publication practical E line design was able to demonstrate compatibility between the loads at failure. And predictive failure loads for a masonry wall. So you can see that the failure patterns of laterally loaded masonry walls are similar to those of uh, reinforced concrete slabs uh, in the image. Um, so to use a simply supported slab as an example, we will have a point of maximum bending 
at the mid span, which means we have a point of maximum ultimate moment in the location of the yield line uh, will form and a hinge will form causing an unstable structure. So uh, comparable to how a masonry panel behaves, when it bends, the brick and mortar starts to pull away from each other. Uh, at the point of maximum bending moment is where we will have maximum tension in the inside face of the wall. So this is the point where our yielding happen or our hinge forms in, on the masonry panel. And they also behave a bit differently as they behave as orthotropic. So they have different flexural strengths in either direction, which is, again, different from concrete. Um, the flexural strength for masonry panels is about three times stronger in one plane uh, than the other. So the plane perpendicular to the bed reinforcement, uh, i.e. left or right, uh, is, is, is three times stronger than the plane par parallel. So uh, the one span up and down. So that's that's reflected in the Euroco tables as well, which we'll cover in the next slide. So that also means because of the different strengths in the planes, this affects the patterns in the panels differently. And the yield line analysis has to take this into account in its, in its design. Um, as a simple example there, I carried out a quick test on our master series masonry designer to check introducing bed reinforcement to a regular wall panel. And we can see there how uh, in the top it's unreinforced and the bottom it is reinforced with our bed reinforcement. And we can see how we can we can affect the, the yield line pattern just by introducing that um, that reinforcement. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a this is a benefit of yield line analysis and that we as designers can have an influence on how the yield line patterns are formed uh, and have some uh, a bit of control on where they yield. Um, and at this point, we're going to direct you to our, our technical note on the subject written by Barry Miller, who can uh, get into the complexities of the mesh generation and the iterative computational process required to identify the yield pa line patterns and therefore the failure mechanisms for different panels. Uh, the technical note also explains the process of validation carried out for those who are interested uh, and the results of the advanced yield line analysis for, um, as I say, for those who are interested. Um, but a fairly complex topic I'm trying to cover there in a, in a slide, um, but it is the foundation for our actual Eurocode methods. So uh, within the Eurocode traditional analysis, we do talk about the flexural strength method, which is the more more widely used approach um, and which is also used in the British standards. The other traditional method being the arching method, which depends on rigid supports to resist, resist arch dust, but we will not cover this. Um, for the for the flexural arch design, the design procedure is iterative and it's summarized as, as follows. So we make uh, an initial assumption of support conditions. Uh, uh, we covered some of those uh, earlier. Um, we make assumptions as to the strength and thickness of the masonry units required. Uh, so the masonry, the, the, the minimum wall thickness of uh, or thickness of one leaf of cavity wall is uh, 100 mil. Uh, we check the serv serviceability slenderness limits uh, using the de dimensions of our panel. Uh, we determine our orthogonal ratio, mu and bending moment coefficient, so appropriate to our panel shape and as mentioned, our bending moment coefficients are set out in Table 9 of the code, and essentially the coefficients are, are generated from the yield line theory we talked about. Um, we determine the design value of the applied moment, MED. Um, there, uh, we take into account our panel dimensions, our bending moment coefficients, our wind load, and our orthogonal ratio, so our, uh, our, our two different plane strengths, flexural strengths. Uh, within that, so uh, point six there, we check the design value of the moment of resistance, MRD, uh, and within that, we've got our compressive resistance, our flexural strength, uh, partial factors factors mentioned earlier, and our vertical loads and our section modules. So if our uh, MED is greater than our uh, MRD, then the wall is acceptable. If not, we can go back and uh, repeat uh, step one or two, and then we can check our shear when it's all said and done. And uh, it's a fairly straightforward check, and it can be found with the help of a simple table, basically taking into account the mortar and the uh, and the bricks area. So, um, for for one and two supports uh, spanning one direction, we can use standard formula. But for walls supported on three and four sides, I think two way spanning slabs, tabulated bend and minimum coefficients uh, have been created for all all conditions considering the number of supports, length, height, and orthogonal ratio. 
um, and some some table examples there. But there's uh, pages of, of, of tables like those uh, in relation to uh, or, or different dimensions. Um, and obviously, to deal with openings, uh, we mentioned earlier, our sub-panel method is, is how we typical, typically deal with openings in, in Eurocode as a, as a standard method. Um, I hope I've given you some relevant design knowledge, or at least some additional understanding of, of the topic, if you're new to it. Uh, because masonry design is typically outside of a 3D model environment uh, of a structural analysis software, it does require uh, us as engineers to manually input a lot of the parameters and basically inform the panel of its surroundings. So uh, in a lot of cases, this is done conservatively, understandably at times, because designs are additive and manual design updates can be laborious. But the more, the more we develop our understanding of the different elements, then the, the better. Um, so also, maybe a bit of food for that there, and how improving your mason design is important for not only all the parties involved, for example, the architect, contractor, uh, ourselves, the engineers, and the client. But considering the scale of the market uh, we're, we're in, uh, it could be beneficial for the environment as well to, to streamline some of these designs. So thankfully, we have an excellent bit of software and master series that covers everything I've talked about as well and more. So Andres, he can, he can take you through that. So I'll, I'll hand you back. OK, so let me start uh, my software demo with a small comparison example of the advanced yield line analysis and the traditional method, the traditional sub-panel method. Okay, so here uh, we are dealing with a basic test wall panel, uh, which is uh, five meter wide and three meter high, and it is a, a cavity wall. Uh, the inner leaf is a 100 mil, mil concrete block. Uh, the outer leaf, leaf is uh, 100 and 2.5 mil uh, clay brick. And the wall, uh, the wall is fixed at the bottom and pinned on the on the sides. And we have uh, a 0.8 kilonewton per square meter uh, lateral uniform load. So this is the model. The left program uses the advanced yield line analysis. And uh, while the program on the right side uses uh, the traditional method. As we can see, uh, we are getting uh, some results uh, uh, from both the advanced yield line analysis and the subpanel method or the, uh, the traditional method. And as you see, uh, the moment capacity is quite the same. So uh, the advanced yield line analysis gives us uh, 83, 84 uh, percent, and the traditional method gives us uh, 83 percent. And this is because uh, uh, the tabulated values of the traditional method are derived from uh, yield line analysis. But before we move on, let's uh, look at these yield lines. So, uh, so we can see uh, blue and green lines. Uh, the blue ones represent the sagging moment. The green uh, green ones represent uh, the hugging moment around the, the fixed support. And of course, uh, the program calculates uh, all the uh, all the, the possible uh, yield lines in the background and give you the uh, the, the most uh, dominant one. Okay, let's introduce uh, an opening. So let's say one mil, uh, one meter by one meter. Sorry, by one meter by one meter here and and uh, the same opening one meter by one meter by one meter by one meter okay and let's analyze the line analysis also okay so as we can see using the advanced yield analysis uh, the program recalculated uh, the yield lines and using the, the dominant yield lines pattern, um, the, uh, it, it also recalculated the, the unity ratio as well, which is a bit higher, but it's still working. But on the other side, as we can see, we can see uh, massive failures. The traditional method um, 
the traditional method uh, says, as, as Patrick mentioned, in case of opening, the panel must be split it into uh, sub panels. So this is what you can see uh, on the graphic. So we have uh, four sub panels, two above, uh, above and below the, the, the opening, and we have a left panel and the right panel. And as you can see, uh, uh, the dominant panel is the, is the top one, which is uh, more than three times overstressed. And, the, and of course, uh, it's failing. Uh, if, we, if we go back to the openings, we can see that we have two options. So the main panels uh, can uh, span horizontally, one uh, can span vertically. So this is the uh, this is the choice of the of the engineer. If we um, switch uh, to the to the, to the uh, vertical spanning uh, version, you can see it's mm, simply different. It's so again here. Uh, the this slender left uh, left panel, uh, of course, is failing. It's it's it's, um, it's, it's more than um, three times overstressed. If we choose to to select, uh, if we choose to select span vertically, then we have the option to use partial fixity the main sub panels. So here we can uh, turn this off, and this will increase the size of the panel above and below the, the openings. So here you can see some uh, uh, some uh, extra uh, uh, panel, uh, panels above and below the openings. And it will also uh, take a partial fixity equal to 50% 50, 50 of the height to increase the, the support on the vertical edges of the main sub panels from fully free to, uh, to partially, uh, partially simply. Uh, supported. Okay, so this was the uh, this was the the, the short uh, comparison of the of the two methods. So now you can see uh, uh, how uh, the the two method methods uh, work. Next, I will next I uh, next I would like to quickly present you how you can accurately uh, design measuring walls with. Uh, uh, with an arrangement of openings combined with pin post and bench joint reinforcement. To do this, let's uh, add a new model or a new brief uh, to this. So let's say webinar. Yep. And here we go. So this is our default uh, wall panel. It's a cavity wall, um, 100 mil uh, inner leaf, 102.5 mil outer leaf, and uh, it is pinned on, on uh, at three edges at fixed uh, on, on the base. So let's have, uh, set up the the wall. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go for a 5.25 uh, meter wide and 3.25 high wall. If you don't want the cavity. There is an option uh, to to design just a simply uh, uh, a single leaf wall by turning this uh, this switch off. And of course, if you want, uh, we can turn. Uh, if you want pierce, we can turn that on, uh, and then we can add. Uh, uh, we can we can we can set the, we can add the the, the dimensions. But uh, now I want to keep this uh, simple, so I will go back to a simple cavity wall. Okay, uh, support conditions. So we have four edges, as I mentioned. Uh, I can ask the I, uh, uh, I can ask them to be pinned or fixed uh, or even partially fixed or even uh, free. So these are the options. Uh, and yes, and then uh, we can also modify them differently uh, to each leaf. So if we turn this off, then we have uh, options to set uh, the inner leaf uh, uh, fixities, uh, the, the 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 leaf fixities uh, separately. Okay, let's go uh, to the masonry. Okay, uh, inner leaf concrete block 
yeah, it's okay. Group two, class two, and category two. And I'm gonna go for a standard, let's say, 7.3 uh, Newton blocks. Outer leaf, clay brick, yeah, it's good. Group one, uh, water, moisture absorption, seven to 12, yes. And class two and uh, category two. And let's say, let's use again the standard 15 Newton uh, per square millimeter, uh, square millimeter uh, bricks. And finally, uh, the mortal designation. Let's say let's use the M4 both for the inner and for the for the for the outer leaf. Okay, let's add uh, some volloding on it, uh, and I'm gonna go for a uh, for an eccentric load. So let's say we have a dead load of two kilonewton per meter. And we have a dead load of uh, one point, uh, sorry, a life load of uh, one point uh, uh, five kilonewton per meter, and eccentricity uh, is the default uh, tw uh, twenty mil. Okay, and I'm gonna put on let's see, an out of plane, yeah, a point nine five kilonewton per uh, square meter wind load. Uh, onto this ball. Okay. And because I have turned on the auto solve, I have to click on uh, the analysis button. And we will see that the, the, the wall is failing. So as we can see, it's 5% uh, it's five per, uh, overstressed. And uh, the, the problematic uh, area is, is, is the lateral loads. So what we can do uh, to, to strengthen uh, to strengthen uh, strengthen the wall. So we can widen the wall. So we can go back uh, to the wall setup, and we can see. Okay, let's go for a, a 140 mil uh, inner leaf, and if you reanalyze it, then we will see. Uh, we, we, we can see uh, it's working now, or we can go back to the 100 mil, and we can go to the masonry, and we can try to use. Of course, we can go for, a, for example, a, a 70.5 newton um, uh, concrete block, and if you reanalyze it, we see. Is working. However, um, however, the program gives us a warning to consider to increase the node density as we are uh, close to the failure. So you can see uh, the unit ratio is, be is below one. However, because we are uh, we are very close to the to, to the one, so that's why the program uh, uh, gives us uh, this, this warning. So here we can. Uh, go for a we can we can go for a fine uh, or even a super fine. But rather than do this, uh, I get, I will go back to the standard uh, 7.3, and I will show you what other options we have uh, to strengthen the wall. Okay, uh, let's start with the with the reinforcement, and let's inner leaf uh, reinforce inner leaf uh, reinforcement first. Okay, you have two options. Uh, you can use the uh, the standard uh, horizontal bars, or we have uh, we have a big uh, range of libraries. So you can use uh, any of these uh, products from the library. So, for example, let's select the Baker uh, move for compact, and let's use the uh, the internal I50. And uh, let's say they will be in every Two to five mil, which is uh, which is the same as uh, so we have uh, reinforcement at every uh, block work uh, courses. And if we reanalyze it, you will see that so 
So we can see that uh, the wall uh, the wall now works um, at around uh, 80 uh, 90 percent. Okay, so let's introduce uh, two openings now. So I will uh, I will go at uh, one meter by one meter by one meter by one opening. So this will be a window. And uh, the next opening, I want to, uh, to add uh, three meter long at, at zero, and the width will be one meter, height will be two meter, and this will be a window. And let's say the, uh, so this will be a door. And let's say the window uh, span two way, and uh, the door spans uh, vertically. Okay, so let's realize it now. And of course, uh, you can see that adding these two openings, uh, uh, the, the, the wall is 12% uh, overloaded uh, for, for lateral loading. So we can we can run back and try to add uh, more reinforcement. So for example, we can add uh, outer uh, uh, reinforcement as well. So I'm going to select uh, the same library, move for compact, and let's add the external A35 uh, and reanalyze it. Okay, and now you can see uh, um, it it is working now. So uh, using uh, outer and inner leaf uh, by joint reinforcement, uh, the wall uh, is, is working. Okay, but let's see let's see the other options. Let's try to add uh, or uh, try to use uh, a win post. But uh, I go back and just turn off both. And the outer leaf and the and the inner leaf uh, the the in, uh, inner leaf uh, reinforcements. Okay, uh, wind post. So let's place and the wind post right in the middle. So let's say it's uh, 2.5 meter. And the cross section is. Let's use uh, an SHS and let's say and the cross section is. Let's use uh, 60 by 60 by 4, for example, and uh, the material is S355. Uh, okay, and analyze it. So here it is. You can see uh, the wind post is uh, placed in the middle, and here you can see uh, the wind post uh, uh, just. Uh, Placed in the in the wall. Of course, you can you can you can uh, you can place your 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 wind post in the in the middle as well, or you can embed it into uh, into your into your wall. Uh, here, if you open up the wind post and dialog again, you can see there is a uh, there is an option to break uh, to break uh, either inner leaf uh, or outer leaf uh, continuity or both. Okay, as we can see, or as we as you can see, uh, the wind post uh, strengthened the wall, but it was not strong enough uh, to break break the continuity, and the yield lines go through uh, the wind post, as you can see. If we go back uh, to the cross section, and if we select a slightly bigger one, like uh, 40 by 40 by 4 SHS. And if you realize again, uh, reanalyze it again, then we will see now that the yield lines uh, only occurred on the on the right side. But of course, it, it doesn't mean that the program only just calculated the right side. Uh, the, the program calculated all the possible yield line patterns, but uh, now this is uh, this is the dominant one. This is what uh, this is the pattern that the program used to calculate. Uh, the uh, unity uh, ratio. 
Okay. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the uh, so this is the design, uh, the Mesori design, uh, using the the year line analysis. So, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, um, I would like to thank everyone uh, to attending today. Uh, I hope you have, you enjoyed and learned in this presentation, and see you on our next webinar. If you have any questions, you can get in touch with us uh, on our uh, usual channels. If you want to try out uh, the, the master series, just go to the just go to the master series website masterseries.com and fill in the request to do so. After the webinar, please do not forget to fill in uh, the short uh, one-minute survey to let us know how you like uh, how you like uh, the webinar. So. Uh, thank you very much again uh, and goodbye.